And I really do believe that if you come to the class, you're going to do better in the final exam. Don't come to the class. Because the final exam is going to have um, basically more things than that we've covered since the last exam, plus some things that are comprehensive for the whole um, uh, semester course. If I'm telling you this and you're actually here, you're going to probably be better as well. So please keep coming. We only have three more classes. The, um, I think, the uh, quote for the day, there's actually kind of two. Uh, this is presumably what Albert Einstein actually said. And um, again, it's not crossed out. It said, said, it can scarcely be denied that the supreme goal of all theory is to make irreducible basic elements as simple and as few as possible without having to surrender the adequate representation of a single datum of experience. Does anybody understand that? Want to explain what that says? You don't have to be right, but you think you know what he was saying there. Uh, <coughs> take a shot at it and see what you want. Yeah, I think that's a fair way of saying it. A lot of people also didn't really understand what he said, so thankfully a writer um, spoke with Albert Einstein apparently and asked him what he meant, and, and he said that he meant this. <laughs> so everything should be made as simple as possible, but no simply. We're going to get to this today because we spent uh, pretty much most of the semester uh, arriving at a model uh, that explains how um, humans view the world and how the world interacts with humans so that we can begin to think about how we want to implement aspects of this within computer systems how we can use computing systems to better understand how things uh, work. And while the, the model has a lot of elements to it, because we've spent time throughout the course going through all of those elements, uh, I would expect that by now, you would be able to actually draw this thing out on a piece of paper um, and fairly well remember what all the pieces should be that go into the model and how they connect to each other. Um, but there are some points and times when it might be simple. It might be useful to even simplify that model even more uh, to learn other things. And we're going to do that today. So we're going to start with the model we had last time, make it even more complex, uh, and then simplify it a, a bit as we talk about perspective. Uh, the final exam is still on May 13th. Uh, in room 203, you might be tempted to walk automatically to this room with case you either be freaked out because the door will be closed or you'll end up taking a totally different one. <laughs> so if you want the one for this course, 203, I suggest you bring up um, uh, two things actually. Uh, Pencils as per usual, but bring more than one just in case sometimes when people are nervous they break their pencil. And uh, not that you're going to be nervous. And then also bring uh, paper. You can bring blank paper. Uh, you cannot bring paper that has anything written on it. So you can't bring any notes. You can't inadvertently have a paper with notes. You're only allowed blank paper. 
Uh, and the reason is that you're probably going to want to write some things down or think about things. Um, you, you'll turn all of that in, your notes, uh, whatever you write anything on, you'll need to turn it in. Um, but you can put it at the back. Um, I think that's the main thing about the final. <coughs> there is not going to be a, an online free final. So everything that you're going to do is going to be within that uh, two hour period. I feel really good that you're going to do really well. But you should definitely get some rest the night before and, and, and think through uh, what we've done in the course. Um, and then uh, the way I see it is the other important part is to review the class slides and your notes from everything, all the classes we've had since the last season. That's going to be emphasized more. So everything's going to be covered, but that's going to be weighted more in this, this exam. Uh, in part because we haven't covered it in an exam, but also because what we've done since that exam sort of ties the whole class together anyway. I want to make sure that you understand those times. Uh, I don't think we have class on May 1st. There's so many of these calendars that come out. If I miss one, you do let me know. Um, but right now, I'm not planning on having class on that day because it says that it's, uh, it's the day of the professor and the student. So that means there's only three classes left. Um, I'm pretty much planning on presenting new material throughout, and not really having a review. Uh, if there are some things that you want to review, uh, I'm still going to have my office hours on each of those days, the first, uh, the sixth, and the eighth. And if you feel like you need more time, uh, send me up with these videos. I'm around. Uh, the book you should be reading, um, and hopefully you're at least uh, most of the way through chapter eight. By next week, I would expect you to be done with chapter eight and well into chapter nine. And here's what we're going to get through today. Uh, we're going to get through external agent influences. Um, and then we're going to get into perspective science. I don't know that we'll get all the way through the perspective response process, um, but I do expect we'll at least get through the cycle, which is going to be the more simplified model that I talked about. If you look, if I had shown this maybe the first day of class, uh, there's an attendance passing around. Uh, if I had shown this the first day of class, um, I don't know if it would have, I'm guessing it would have looked really complicated. Whoa, there's so many different things in there. There's arrows going around everywhere. Um, because if you look at this, there's five, six, six plus six, 12, 17, 17 to 18 blocks, depending on how you look at it. Um, and there's arrows that are going all sorts of different directions, not just one way. Uh, at the beginning of the course, you might have thought, like a lot of people, uh, have previous thought that we react to the world. We just sit here and then when things happen, we uh, So another reason to come to class is there's no guarantee that the, the actual uh, class recording is going to be on there. And not everything that you need to know is on the slide. It's a combination of the slides and what I talked about. Uh, okay, so, um, so by now I would expect you to pretty much know what all these blocks are. It shouldn't be a memorization. It can be, 
but you should be able to recognize that you interact with the world uh, you know, through the sensible energies and that you have all these senses and that your mind is playing an active role in predicting what's happening at the same time. You have all this information coming in. Uh, and that, that's basically uh, what, it, what it means to be a human being from a modeling perspective. And I think to the extent that you understand these blocks and why their interactions going in different directions, then we've done a, a, a good job in this course. Okay, so now we're going to make the model a little bit more complex because we're going to have two people. So if you want to think about it, when you're talking about your senses and um, your thoughts and your memories and your emotions and your motivations, the attention, all that's going on mostly within you. And people don't have direct access to any of them. Even the things that you see, people don't have direct access to. You could say, well, I'm looking at that, um, I'm looking at the TV there, the monitor, and all of us are looking at the monitor. But the reality is I'm looking at the monitor with the glare that's coming from that uh, window. And I actually haven't done this, but I'm guessing you're sitting over here at this device chair, and you're not actually seeing much of the glare. Uh, and he's got a much better view of the material. Uh, I can tell that if you're sitting in the back, Probably not thinking what's up here. Just thought process. Some of you have glasses on, some of you don't have glasses on. Um, some of you are sitting towards the back, so it's in the front. So you really, even though we exist in some reality, our realities are all, uh, as we understand things today, completely clear and completely different than necessarily. Because even if you uh, want to right now, we don't know how to get access to, to get access to what you're thinking of the earth. We don't know how to do that. We also don't know how to put you in the same physical spot so that we're looking at, at the same thing as part of the reality. Now, you could create scenarios where you put you know, uh, virtual reality glasses on and put the same image. At least you can say, well, I, I think we're probably seeing the same thing. Or at least we'll be exposed to this exact same stimulus. But you remember that your uh, minds are filled with the perceptions of whatever you can show you. You're going to have different emotional responses to the different things that you are shown to you. And so, how do you know what someone else is feeling? Now, as you don't. You can ascribe to what someone else is feeling uh, something that helps you communicate with that person in some way. Really, I don't know what it actually is. When I say no, I mean no in the strictest sense, scientific sense of the word. So when we communicate with someone else, all I've done here is I took that the model from the previous slide and I flipped it over so I could combine. The, uh, the middle part, the middle part being the sensible energies. Um, so I think I can annotate up. I'm not sure I've never, ever done this here, but so I'm talking about this part in here. Now you notice I kept the the blue boxes separate. Blue boxes are the sensible energies. And, and then the boxes that those feed into, then you, those are your senses, your different senses. The reason I kept them se separate is because you don't actually, also, you don't sense the same sensible energies. Because if I take a candy bar and I break it into pieces and I give oh. you part of it, I take one part of it, and I put it in my mouth and put it in your mouth, we're not. 
tasting the same actual uh, biomolecules that comprise that, that bar. Um, you can go to another level and say, okay, well, what if two people put their tongues together and dropped, you know, some ice cream on it, but they taste the same ice cream? Reality is no, right? Because those interactions of those buds with yours, and whatever portion is interacting with theirs, even if you sloshed it around by the time you came back, it would be, it would be altered. Right? Um, so the same with the, with, the, with the things that you see. The actual uh, sensible energy from the screen or photons that are coming and interacting with your eyes, they're being absorbed by your eyes. Once that happens, it's basically gone. Um, so there's this overlap of occurrences where the occurrences can give rise to um, related sensing molecules, right? but they're not the same sensing molecules. So how do two? Um, so what I'm showing here is what I'm calling communications between the two people, because you also communicate through the sensing molecules. Um, you can't read any of this here, but it's the same slide from last time. Um, what's going into the sensible energies from you are actions, which could be communications, which could be verbal or not. I'm going to go through the different ways we communicate shortly. Oops, now i got to figure out how to get rid of this uh, entity. Probably an easier way, but this might work. Okay. So here, when we say communications, we're really um, looking at it in a different light than what you may normally think of communication. Normally, when we think of communications, we think of visual or verbal communications. Um, but really, what we see here is that there's really no separation between communications and our influences on the sensible energies. If you can um, take an action that creates or modulates or changes a sensible energy, um, then you can do something that someone else can sense. If you do it in some way that there's some mutual understanding of the meaning of that, then you communicate. <clears throat> so we may think of communication as more so the things on the left, what, I, what I'm calling verbal here to include oral and written at the same time. So using words, for example, in speeches or classes like I'm giving here, or in conversations, letters or emails where we're using words or text, Debates is a form of communication, or words used in uh, radio, audio, TV, or film, internet articles, books. So that's kind of what we normally think about about communication. But we already know in this class um, that nonverbal communication is really important. And some forms of nonverbal communication are facial expressions, which uh, are not emotional fingerprints. You know. Uh, gestures, right, what I can do with my hands, uh, but it really doesn't end there because anything that I can do to influence or create a sensible energy that can be sensed by someone else and interpret it is a way of communicating. So I can communicate by touch. I can touch someone's shoulder. I often do that. Um, sometimes if I'm with my wife and we're talking to someone, um, I might touch her, she might touch me. I don't know what it means, but it means whatever I'm saying probably isn't what she wants me to say. Um, or it might mean that, hey, we gotta go, you know, in some way. Usually I know what it means because of the context that I'm in, even if it's the same kind of touch. Um, but we can also 
communicate with space. So here I'm modulating the visual space, I'm modulating the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, or the physical space through the forces. So uh, when you get close to someone, not only are you modulating what, what they're able to see, but if you get really close, you can modulate the air movements around where, where that person is. And so that could be a way of communicating. If I get up close to someone, I don't even have to break them, right? But I'm communicating with different functions. Maybe with Wi Fi and Bluetooth distance. You just randomly walk up to someone close. You're going to get their attention. You're going to communicate with them. You get in their face, they might hit you or push you away. Essentially, or unintentionally to them, and you're correct. Um, what about smells? You may communicate that you're at the gym. So, intentionally or not intentionally. Or that you've been working hard on a project and you haven't taken a shower and you have to do something else. So, sometimes I communicate with my, uh, with my wife through smells um, by, uh, by, by giving her some flowers. Those smell the flowers and she sees them. Those smells are a way of communicating to her. Flavors are that way. If you really don't like someone, you like the moment of dinner, you cook the house Or a pain. Maybe I can cook this on. But it could be a way of saying, you know what, I communicated in some way that I don't really like. It. Or, I don't like you. One of what people do is they invite someone over to eat. They want to make sure, or they take someone out to eat. They want to make sure they can take the person out to eat. Or they have to drink, or whatever it is that you enjoy doing. So, that's a way to communicate very flavors that you don't sell, right? But it's really important. If someone takes you out to eat, um, and the take it out to close to the presentation is good, and it smells good, and it tastes good. They communicate to them in a variety of different ways. Um, something about maybe how they feel about you, or what kind of value you have, such. Uh, hygiene, we talked about a little bit. Uh, artifacts, the things that we have, or the things that we don't have. Clothing or accessories. So um, I'll ask two questions here. I'll give you the first one in terms of artifacts. I actually don't don't wear any jewelry. I don't have any watch. I don't have any boots. I don't have. I still have. On occasion, I will wear glasses. Has anybody ever seen me wearing sunglasses? Those sunglasses communicate with me. What? I don't like what? I don't like too much light. What else? Sensitive light. And what? And I was right. <laughs> Do you remember anything about the sunglasses? What color are you? Brown? I can't have some brown. Hello? I have some brown. I have some black ones, red ones, and blue ones. I don't know what those. Okay, so what did that communicate to someone who sees me wearing this sunglasses? I like glasses. I actually do like I like glasses. Glasses for some reason they make me feel I don't know why. I like I like wearing them. So it's not that I wear them but they're the same. They're different. And when I get up in the morning or when I go out, I actually think about which glasses I want to wear and what color. So I do have some artifacts that I don't tend to wear the morning. What about clothing?
So that's nice because now we don't have to go back to that model that we built and figure out what we're going to do with communication. Communication is already in there because any action that we can take or not take that influences or doesn't influence the sensible energies or occurrences is the only way we can actually communicate. And we do communicate in that way when we do that. So that's why when people say actions speak louder than words, it's not something that doesn't make any sense. It kind of makes sense. Right? Because actions do communicate. They don't speak in the way we think about speaking, but they communicate. So actions communicate, inactions communicate. Someone that's a, a, a friend or a family member passes away, and you, know, you don't show up at the funeral, you didn't go to the funeral, but you still communicated something to the people that are there and say, where is the person? Okay. Okay. 
Okay, so the good news is our model is not going to get any more complicated. <laughs> and we're going to talk about influences now, but influence is just communication. It's just a form of communication. Last class online, uh, we talked about communication in a traditional sense being information that you want to get from point A to point B, person A to person B. You take that information, uh, you encode it, you transmit it, the other person receives it, unencodes it, and interprets it. And hopefully they interpret it with a concept that's the same or comparable to the concept that the person had who chose the information. But then we realize, okay, well that's great for computer science, um, and that's great when we're just trying to send facts and knowledge back and forth. But the second part of that was, well, what if we we all, what if we really just want to influence someone? We want to make someone do something, something or we want someone to feel a certain way about us. Right? There is a different concept. I need to communicate, and it's not knowledge and facts. In fact, if I want to communicate to someone that I really care about, I start communicating a bunch of knowledge and facts, I may inadvertently communicate to them that all I care about is myself, right? or that I think I'm smart because I just keep giving them this, this knowledge and facts. Right? So communication, a lot of our communication, and I ch I not challenge you, but I encourage you to think about this for your own self, to reinforce the self-awareness we were talking about. A lot of our communication is to try to get things to happen, or try to get things not to happen. So it's actually not information that I want to convey. Now that happens, I'm not saying that doesn't happen. The same, a lot of communications aren't about exchanging information, they're about influencing the world around us and the people around us. That's going to be an important distinction when we think about computers and computer and computer analysis. Now, a lot of communications between computers is exchange of information. We're not necessarily influencing the computer. But to have human perspective artificial intelligence, we are going to begin to influence a computer and to see what the computer does. It's not just instructing the computer to do something, sending an instruction. It's not just taking a thumb drive and putting all the files and copying it onto the hard drive of the robot, right? It's touching the robot, see what it does. Not knowing <laughs> predeterministically what, it, what it's going to do. The robot doesn't know you're going to touch it, and the robot doesn't even know what it's going to do when you touch it. It depends. So we finally get to plug in all this fun stuff we spent a lot of time in the beginning of the course. And we did that, you might recall, because some of these concepts are fairly complex, and I didn't want to present it for the first time at the end of the course. So we see that really, these common influence tactics, and this isn't the 26, this is just a different rendition of common influence tactics. Because remember, there were more, we just used that from the book. Um, that we realize that all of these things are, are really related to communications. We're just communicating, we're influencing. And we can do this in a lot of different ways. I can flatter someone um, by giving them flowers, right? whether it's a male or a female, um, I can do that. I can, I can um, let someone know that they're important uh, by bringing them uh, the pieces of the first pineapple that I ever grew at my house here in Puerto Rico, which is what I did with the people that I worked with here at the office. Right? How is that communication? Because they know that didn't magically appear there, so they know that at some point they have to be cut up and put in a little thing and then brought the toothpicks and little napkins and put them in. So I've communicated a lot through that and in a way I'm, I'm influencing them. I don't know what they're going to do. I don't even know if they like pineapple, but I'm going to influence them. They're going to go back, they're going to, they're going to try the pineapple because um, they feel obligated to try the pineapple. <laughs> Or they may try the pineapple because they really like pineapple, or they may try it because 
know, any number of reasons. I, I, I don't know. Like, all I can do is, I, I know that I brought the pineapple just to share, share with you. Um, I brought uh, uh, lollipops, or I don't know what you call them, the, the gum uh, sucker things to class. Um, on occasion, I was going to uh, teach you something with the popcorn. I brought the chocolate because I didn't want you to sit there and say, wow, I just want popcorn. I didn't get to do anything. Um, so those are all, all forms of, of influence. They're all forms of influence. And this is just a, la a list. Okay? You've seen more than this, and by now you're experts on, on influence. So when we influence, we communicate. It's just a form of communication. That's all it is. And I'm going to show you now three effects of communicating um, to influence. Remember, you can influence others whether you know you're influencing them or not. And you can do it whether you know you're doing it or not. And you can do it whether you know how you're going to influence them or not. So there's a lot of variables here. But generally, when people influence other people, there's one of three things that they're looking for them to do. Or that they're doing. Uh, the first one is you're going to influence their thought, what they're thinking. So some examples, so what, where this comes from is taking the common influence tactics and seeing, okay, how are they normally used, and then see what effect they normally have. So you may influence someone that thinks about something, and here's a list. Uh, you might influence some, someone that believe they did something wrong, or believe they believe something that's not right, believe something that's negative or positive about someone, Believe something positive about themselves. Believe something negative about themselves. It's not meant to be a comprehensive list. The point is that you're communicating. Um, but the communication, the point of the communication, isn't to exchange information per se. It's to cause a reaction, to cause something to happen in, in someone else's thoughts. Uh, it could be their thoughts, or it could be their thoughts that lead to their actions. So influence can influence someone to do something, such as take some sort of action, uh, take some kind of action to face consequences, so that could be like bullying uh, or threat, take some kind of action involuntarily if you push someone, that's a form of communication. So avoid something, focus attention to something, uh, and then you influence the feelings, the, the, the emotional thoughts that they have. You might help someone feel more comfortable, uh, or you might make them feel uncomfortable. Sometimes in the class, you'll hear me reference the finals. That's a form of influence. When I do that, it's for two reasons. One, I want to pick, I want to highlight something that I know is going to be likely important in the exam. And two, I want to make sure that you at least have an opportunity to be alerted to me. Because you're here. And I want you to do well in the exam. Or you might uh, cause the person to feel uh, happy or, or laugh or smile. So these are things that you may cause someone else to do, but at all times, other people are causing this of you. Again, whether or not they mean to or, or not, they're influencing you. If right now, that half of the room just spontaneously got up and ran out the door, that will influence this half of the room. And you wouldn't just sit here and keep doing the class. We might, but it would be weird. <laughs> all right, so, um, so I consider all this relatively good news in the sense that our model, uh, which is not really complicated, I don't think. It just has a lot of things in it. A lot of things that influence us. And so that's why when people, I think, over the course of thousands of years have tried to understand human beings, um, they've struggled with it some because it's really hard to understand a human being in an environment that has so many different types of occurrences, so many types of forms of communication, some that are discrete, some that are not, some that are intentional, some that are 
But to get anything out of this course, recognize that it's not really all that complicated. You can draw a model and explain almost anything. That model that we have now, that we come to the class, thanks to the person, one of the people that contributed, the one I adapted, and another two uh, had also uh, <coughs> uh, very good models, and just one the one I, I chose to, to adapt. Um, that pretty much covers everything. If not, that's great. If you recognize something that's not in the model and you don't see how it fits, then that's an opportunity to, to help it expand, refine, and improve. So I welcome that. If you see something that, that you think is important to humanity that you don't see, how do we account for that in the model? And there are some things that aren't in the model. <clears throat> okay, so. Now we're going to simplify a little bit. We're still going to remember that model because they're implementing a sort of artificial system. We're going to do that, that model and that level of detail. And we can simplify that model if we're going to implement a system that doesn't have taste, or, you know, doesn't have the ability to smell, doesn't have the, um, the, have the ability to generate smells, I guess. Well, I'm not sure if that's possible. Um, but within this model, we know that uh, there are basically three, three things that we're going to influence when we're thinking. We're going to have emotional thinking. So we're going to have things that we're feeling that are going to be important to our thoughts. Uh, we're going to have memories, all sorts of memories, false memories, long-term memories, short-term memories, working memories. And then we're going to have the senses that are interacting with all the sensible energies that are outside of us and that are within us. And all these things are influenced by the occurrences. So the occurrences create the sensible and modulate sensible energies that are sensed. Uh, the occurrences uh, through all of the senses of what's going on external and internal um, uh, affect the reality of our emotional thinking. And they influence the memories that we recall and the memories that we create. You could go back in the slides to Remind yourself what the occurrences are, but I've got a couple of slides here just to remind us because that was something we covered early on in the semester when we were talking about the elements. And we said there are six different types of occurrences, uh, but as far as occurrences that, that affect the emotions, that affect our thoughts, uh, things that we sense in our memories, we really only have to worry about the things on the left. Uh, those are internal, direct, and derived. Because the ones on the right, being inside another or remote, aren't things that directly that we're able to directly sense. Um, so until they cause something to happen, we're not able to sense it because our sensors are sense our sense sense sensible energies. So examples of internal direct and derived on the left are things that we perceive. Uh, your stomach hurts, that's inside of you, right? So that's internal. Uh, you taste sour milk. In some respects, that's direct and also internal. Uh, someone you work for tells you you're fired, that's pretty much direct. You read about an earthquake in a news article, that's derived. That, the actual earthquake happened something else, but now you're reading, reading about it, so it's influencing. Not perceived. You're bitten by a mosquito, but you don't feel it. It doesn't mean that it's not going to influence your body. You might get sick, uh, but it's not going to influence your thoughts because you haven't perceived it. Your friend thinks about you, but doesn't tell you. A boy in Russia falls off his bike, assuming you're not there. Um, and these are the definitions of the Occurrences that we do care about. Internal, direct, and derived. And those were the examples I gave you. That at least this 
slide uh, I put together from slides from a different from a previous course. Internal are uh, things that are internal to you. That they're, that, um, they're things that are going on inside of you, either physically or, or in your thoughts. Uh, direct occurrences are things that you can perceive through your senses, and derived occurrences are things that are communicated to you in some way that relate to something that happened that you didn't uh, perceive. And so the missing box in this simplified version of our model is, is perspective. So that means that there's a lot of things that have gone on in perspective. But first, let's see what Webster thinks perspective is. Definition here, a mental view. So it's a way of thinking about things, a mental view or prospect. Um, a visible scene that's a little different than what we mean here in perspective. A visible scene can be part of perspective. Uh, but we know here that perspective uh, in the model of the human uh, is the combination of all of what's going on. Uh, the interrelationship in which a subject or its parts are mentally viewed, and the capacity to view things in their true relations or relative importance. Now, both of those are aspects of what we talk about here as perspective. And the appearance to the eye of objects in respect to the relative distance and position. Who here has an iPhone? iPhone? Okay, have you ever taken a selfie? Is the picture that comes out from your iPhone selfie the same thing you're looking at when you take the selfie? Okay, what's the Okay, so there's some filtering and adaptation. Anything else? What? Okay, I had to ask because I don't have an iPhone. I assume they work the same way, but on, on Android phones, that's exactly what it does. Did everybody get that? I think you probably not everybody got that. Because the first time that I realized this, and other people usually they're like, what are you talking about? So if you look at the, when you're taking a selfie, if you look at yourself in the image, once you take the selfie and then go look at the picture, it's flipped. If you don't believe this, I mean, this is something you can try, <laughs> you can try at home. In fact, um, not only is it flipped, so that if you're looking at words, uh, the words will also be flipped. That's an easier way to see it, right? Now the strange thing is, is that when you the, the reason that there's a reason that they do this, it's not just a trick. Um, why does anybody know why they do this? Why wouldn't they just show you like the actual version of what your picture is going to look like. Why do they show you a flipped version of it? This is only for selfie, by the way. If you're doing it the other way, it doesn't happen that way. When you're doing it the other way, you, you see, if I take a regular picture of you all, I'm going to see on my screen this, and when I take the picture, it's going to be this. But if I take a selfie, when I look on the screen, I'm actually looking at I'm looking at a flip of what the actual picture is going to be. The, pic the actual picture is going to be the picture of me as if you took the picture of me. And I'm looking at the screen is actually more of what it would look like if I was looking in the mirror. So it's flipped. Now why is this all important? One, you're being tricked by yourself. <laughs> so you should at least be aware of that. But two, um, it's important for this class because we rarely actually see ourselves how other people see us. The only time we can get close to that is if we're looking at a video someone took of us or a picture that we take of ourselves. When we look in the mirror, 
if you happen to look at the mirror to do your hair or whatever, um, you're actually looking at a flipped version of what most people see when they look at you. What does that mean? It means that in front of your right eye is your right eye. When someone else looks at you, in front of their right eye is your left eye. You're either sitting there like, I know all this stuff, or you're like, well, this is kind of weird. Most people are in that, this is kind of weird category. Uh, but it's important because we go through, when you say, okay, put yourself in someone else's shoes, look at something from someone else's perspective. Um, the reality is that most of the people in your life see you um, in a way that you rarely see yourself, even just um, physically, even just with their eyes. Now, we talked about influence, about how we might influence someone else and communicate. Um, if, if you flip that around and say, well, how do they influence us and communicate? Um, And now we want to put all that together. Okay. Last class we talked about self-awareness. I want to be aware of myself. Um, part of being self-aware is being aware of how others are influencing me. This isn't to say I'm aware of what's going on in their head. Right? It's being aware of what's happening to me based on what's happening to the sensible energies based on the actions or inactions of someone else. Now we have all the inputs, basically. We have we've talked about what's going on in our bodies. We know about the sensors. We know about the sensible energies. Um, we know ways that other people communicate with us. And we know the common ways that we're influenced. There's nothing else. Part of this is just spending more time being, as humans being more conscious about our thoughts. There's some uh, uh, people that use the term mindfulness or uh, meditation. Um, there's some uh, different types of techniques or tools uh, that people use to try to help themselves be more cognizant of their thoughts. That cognition of your thoughts, whether those thoughts are more logical in nature or more emotional in nature, is what we mean by the, by the perspective response. You're going through this cycle all the time. It just may be that oftentimes you may be more aware of what's going on with yourself or less aware. Sometimes you may be more or less aware of how you're being influenced by others. Um, and then you may be less active in the evaluation and choice based on all these things that are happening around you. If you decide, or if you're not active in your evaluation and your choice, you're not going to disappear. There's still going to be this cycle. It's just that the cycle is going to be based on these mini modules basically having their, their way with you, right? More deterministic in nature. So we're going to go through these three steps of the perspective process. Uh, and then we're going to ask ourselves, how can we implement perspective in an artificial intelligence system? And that's where my knowledge tapers off. So we're going to get into a discussion on this because I think that together, hopefully, we can make some progress here with other, where other people have it. And how do you implement perspective in an artificial intelligence system? <coughs> so we saw perspective West, the Webster definition here at the top. I put down a definition for the perspective response process, which is about your outlook, your mindset, and your decision making. Uh, and you're going to have a perspective when anything happens. Sometimes you may be more active in that perspective uh, than not. Okay, so perspective response process is looking at it a different way. It's a space for deliberation uh, where, and it, here they mean a temporal space of like time. It's a space for deliberation where you identify options for purposefully 
and effectively influencing future occurrences in light of your goals. Now that's a, um, it's a more altruistic statement. Ideally, that's what it is that you're doing in your respective response uh, process. So you're taking time to deliberate and you're identifying options for purposely and effectively influencing future occurrences. Okay, so what does it mean to be aware of ourself? It's basically a state of having the knowledge about, about yourself. Okay, but it's not just summary knowledge. Um, it's the knowledge of yourself at that moment in time, being able to project um, things in the future based on your knowledge about yourself and your knowledge about yourself based on past behaviors. To the extent that you understand yourself so that the system can understand itself, uh, then it's going to and uh, it's going to understand how it's going to be influenced by what it remembers, by what it senses, and the emotional thoughts associated. It also is going to know its tendencies. We talked about action tendencies before, uh, but what it normally will do um, if it doesn't really think too much or too hard about it. Uh, so this gets into motives and habits. You can certainly program motive, motives, I'm sorry, motives and habits into an artificial system, uh, but can that artificial system create its own motives and habits? Then there's the awareness of the influence of others. It's the state of recognizing that other humans have their own self, in each of them and we cannot know what it is. And it's important because we influence, are influenced by others regularly and these influences form us. Now this is really, a, a part of this is, I've said this before, I just wanna make sure, it's a subtle point, I wanna make sure you get it. When others communicate, they have some intention sometimes, they have some information that they wanna communicate to you, right? That's sort of the, what most of us think about when we think about communications. When we realize that influence is a form of communication, uh, then we have to realize two things. That someone may have an intent, conscious or unconscious, to influence. And then that there's gonna be an influence. Meaning that even without that intent, that the interpretation of that communication um, could result, it's gonna result in some influence. And that influence may or may not be the influence that was intended by the person that communicated. This happens all the time. <laughs> if you want to communicate something and someone else, you know, gives you an expression on your face and you're like, why are they giving me that expression? I thought I said something funny, but they you know, they seem to be like they were offended or something. Um, so these types of influences happen all the time. And so what's important here is that you're recognizing within yourself how you're being influenced by the communications that are coming in, whether those communications are verbal or non-verbal. Um, which, and remember, communications here now, we're talking broadly as everything that's uh, interacting with or not interacting with the sensible energies that you're um, interpreting through your senses. Now we get to evaluation and choice. Let's see how we're doing on time. We're okay on time. So when we get to evaluation and choice, um, we can divide this up into two, ca two categories. Uh, the first one is called automated condition responses on the left, and the other one is called deliberate and managed responses on the right. If you are going about your day not really giving a whole lot of thought 
uh, to most of the decisions that you make, then you're a normal human being. <laughs> we do things all the time throughout the day. We rarely both obsess about every little thing that we do. <clears throat> That's automated condition responses. That means that these little mind modules that are in the, in the brain um, are suggesting things to you. Concepts that you're creating, that you're comparing to the realities you're perceiving are balanced pretty well. And there's no real need to get overly emotional about something to get your attention about it because things are pretty much going the way you expect them to go. <clears throat> so in our robot, in our artificial system, for the most part, it should be working in a very robotic way. <laughs> Because as Martin Minsky re recognized, humans are machines for the most part, and they actually work fairly robotically. Most of the things that we do every day, breathing, <coughs> have, uh, our heart beating, are things that just happen automatically. We don't think about it, we don't deliberate about it, um, and so forth. Now, when our systems give us a motion so that we know, hey, this is important, you may want to pay attention to this. Maybe the automatic condition response isn't what you want to do in this moment. Uh, or this is important. Pay attention because like, there's some weird pain that's going on in, in, in your stomach. Right? It's our system telling us that our real-time um, thought processes uh, would be would what better serve us at this point in time because this is something that's important or it's something that matters. And it could be something that's just funny, right? Maybe um, you make a choice on what you want to do tonight based on if you're going to laugh a lot with the person that you want or have a good time, right? So it doesn't have to be a serious thing. Um, so those are deliberate managed responses. And um, And so, a lot of what makes us a human being in the context of being different than a machine is really on the right, on the right hand side. Because we can make machines that do the stuff on the left. I can make a machine um, that smokes a pack of cigarettes every day. I can do that, that's a habit. Hopefully you all don't have that habit. Um, but there are people that do have that habit. Right? Why? It's a habit. I can make a machine that um, it scratches its hand. Right? That could be another habit. So automated condition responses are fairly easy to do, and that's something that we've known for a while how to do in artificial systems. Deliberate managed responses, when the artificial system knows that it's an environment where the things that it thinks should happen are not happening, right? The reactions it thinks that should be there aren't there, they're different. Um, it, that's when it needs to become more human. That's when it needs to have perspective so that I can say, okay, I, what I think should be happening isn't happening. Now I've got to explore my options. Part of a deliberate managed response is using time. I may need more information. And it's not necessarily in a database. Right? I may need more information that doesn't exist on Earth because the time hasn't happened. So part of a deliberate managed response in an emotional situation with someone uh, where they seem upset, before I decide what I'm going to do, part of coming to that decision may require an interim decision where I need to get more information. And that information doesn't, it's not accessible to me. It's not in a database. I have to ask the person, is it something I said? No, it's not something you said. It's just, you know, I had a bad day. I don't have that information. Robot's not gonna have that information. Google may have that information because it, artificial systems may have figured out that person has a bad day. Uh, but for the most part, we can at least initially assume it doesn't really know that the person had a bad day. 
Um, so deliberate managed responses are not habitual, they're not uh, done by the subconscious and then automatically selected. Um, they require awareness of ourselves and awareness of the biases that we all have and we use. Uh, it requires using thought and over time. And it requires looking at things from different perspectives. So even that artificial system isn't going to have access uh, in real time to all of the experiences, but more importantly, the state that all of the experiences have left that other robotic system in. So even it is going to need another perspective. Needs to evaluate these other perspectives, consider it of goals and approaches. And if you do this well, you approach free will. That's more of a philosophical um, statement there. But keep in mind that the artificial system, when it interacts with you, it's also not going to have access to what's going on here. So another aspect of this with some examples, uh, hidden snooze on your alarm clock, that can be a habitual or a conditioned automatic response. You're not uh, really deliberating over it, or you may be, but you may be half asleep. Uh, if you are a person that likes to eat dessert after every dinner, um, or if you bite your nails when you're nervous, examples of deliberate, deliberate managing responses might be trying something new, um, quote, finding courage to do something, uh, or in some cases expressing anger or frustration without, quote, losing control. These are going to be different for different people. Uh, this will be the last slide for today. Uh, interfering mental processes, uh, imps, I'm not really sure if there's an analog to this in the artificial intelligence world. So this is something we'll talk about next time with the perspective. Um, but what it is, is it's basically one of these many modules in your subconscious, um, like uh, Minsky's example that said, um, you know, it's not me that wants to eat cake. It's one of my many modules that wants to eat cake. So how am I, which is a combination of all these mini, mini modules with consciousness, it's going through this deliberate perspective response process, what am I going to do? Am I going to do an automated conditioned response and just eat the cake? Many of us do this on a regular basis. I do it on a regular basis. I decided I was not going to eat anything before class today because I had eaten a late lunch. Then I walked, and I purposely didn't walk by the machine that's over here. But then I, today I found there's a machine that's over there. So, um, and I ended up getting a pack of fig newtons. I stayed away from like what I normally would get. I don't know, I don't think there's anything more healthy about fig <laughs> But at least in my mind, figs are a fruit, and I felt like maybe. I just felt different. But mine, there was a mini module that wanted some sort of snack um, before class. Um, and in my deliberate managed response, um, I either decided a free will to do that or I caved into my, uh, to my cake mini module and, and got the figure. So imps are a way of thinking of mini modules that tend to dominate your deliberate uh, managed responses. Um, so you really have to deliberate. You really have to use time and try to separate the time. Right? You have to drink water. Um, I tried that um, yesterday. I tried drinking some water. That was one of the suggestions in class. And it helped. I don't know if it helped because it filled my stomach or it just helped because I did something else and I forgot about what I was thinking about. So we need to think about imps, um, interfering mental processes. Uh, we want to think about perspective. That's where we're going to pick up the next class. And the challenge that we have is 
we have this great model that we can actually implement almost all of it, even emotions. Um, but it's this deliberate managed response in this perspective process where we think about and try to simulate, if you will, the concepts that other people may have um, when we make decisions. That's the part that that we're going to need to do something. So I'm going to ask the class next class uh, to engage with me um, in some discussion like we have in the past, uh, because I have a feeling that we're going to be able to improve our models and uh, that discussion.